I welcome you to our workers training session tonight in Jesus name always happy to see you and I suppose I hope you're happy to see me too of course the Lord bless every one of us in Jesus name let's pray together father we thank you for this hour thank you for this time thank you for your revelation you are giving to us every time we're asking Lord once again you reveal your mind your heart your vision unto everyone in Jesus name I will pray Lord will be the kind of Christian we ought to be the kind of saint we ought to be and a kind of servant we ought to be in Jesus name help us Lord not to just gloss over your word or to take it for granted but to take, to take it to take in everything as if we were hearing for the first time in Jesus name we thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray another amen, amen. you can sit down thank you Tonight we are considering something very significant in the scriptures, very important for every Christian to understand, and for every worker to understand, and for everyone associated with Christ to understand. We are talking about the Christian, about the normal Christian, about the New Testament Christian about the Christian known by heaven, recognized by heaven, and having his name written in the book of life, the normal Christian life. And tonight the topic is the divine approval of the normal Christian life. God doesn't approve any other kind of life. The life he approves the life heaven approves is the normal Christian life. The divine approval of the normal Christian life. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 21 through to verse 26. Acts chapter 11 verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Notice that. They turned unto the Lord. They turned from something. And they turned to someone. They turned from their past life of sinning. And they turned unto the Lord, the Lord of glory. It says in verse 22, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which, it, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Underline that word Antioch. That's the city where the church was. And many people had turned to the Lord in that Antioch. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. How do you see the grace of God? He came to them in Antioch and he saw the grace of God. I thought grace was something invisible, grace was something only in the heart, the manifestation, the reflection of what was inside them the grace he could see their character he could see their behavior and he saw that grace from what the grace produced when he came and had seen the grace of god he was glad and exhorted them all that were purpose of heart they would cleave unto the lord for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people 
were added unto the Lord. That's another way of seeing many people that were not in the Lord before. They came out of their sin, out of darkness. They were added unto the Lord. And it says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. That's the place where many people are turned to the Lord. And many people were added to the Lord. And both Barnabas and Saul were now teachers and preachers and pastors there. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church. The church, the assembly of called out people that had been called out of their sin, out of darkness. They came to the Lord. They assembled with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. In that Antioch where many people turned to the Lord and they were abiding in the Lord and they were cleaving to the Lord, those disciples, those believers, and those saved, justified, converted people, and their lives reflected the grace of God. Those were the people that were called Christians first in Antioch. What does that mean? They lived, they had, they manifested the normal Christian life. And people could see that. And they called them Christians. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. I read from verse 27. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 verse 27. King Agrippa Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Here was Paul the apostle. And was talking to people, leaders in the land, that were together to judge him. And then he gave a testimony. And he made reference to the Old Testament, reaching by the prophets of God as they were inspired by the Holy Ghost. And it's, then he said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And before King Agrippa replied, he said, I know that thou believest. Well, we're going to allow King Agrippa to talk for himself. Others' testimonies about us cannot be 100% true. They don't know us. They don't know our heart. They don't know our mind. They don't know our disposition. They don't know our thoughts. They don't know our secret character. Whatever they say about us, we must still wait to see what comes out of your own mouth and what comes out of your own life. Now Agrippa is going to answer verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. A Christian. You see, there is the normal Christian life that is very clear, crystal, transparent, and heaven approves of that. There's another one that is near the Christian. Is living near the Christian. He knows a Christian. He even knows a preacher. He gives assent to what the preacher is saying mentally, in his mind, in his head, in his brain. But the decision has not been taken to turn away from tradition and from idolatry and from anything that is negative and to turn fully and finally and completely unto the Lord. It's not a Christian yet and Agrippa did not want to say something you know, that wasn't true. He said, almost that persuades me to be a Christian. When a pastor who moderated was 
uh, reminding us that the Lord's Supper for a group, uh, for some of our groups, will take place tomorrow. For our groups here, he did mention there are people who are in the habit of running away from the Lord's Supper. Well, maybe they are telling us that they are not all together fully, completely Christians. There is something in their heart telling them they are not there yet. And they always do that to reveal that they are not there yet and they are not doing anything about it. A great passage. Are you about Christ? I hear what you're saying. And I know about the Christian life. I'm not there yet. Almost. That persuades me to be a Christian. I pray we will be Christians indeed in Jesus' name. We're coming to First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. If you have come to Christ, you are not a stranger to Christ. If you have come to Christ, you are converted by Christ. You are connected to Christ. And your life reflects that you belong to Christ. And because of your conviction, courage of conviction, you are not a secret believer. You come out clear, I'm a Christian, I believe in the Lord, and you accept the reproach, the persecution, whatever will come in your community. And you say, I will not deny Christ. And because of that, you're reproached, you're persecuted. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as a, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any suffer as a Christian, look at that. Is bringing out who a Christian is. It says in the previous verse, don't suffer as a murderer, or you are not a Christian. Don't suffer as a thief, or you are not a Christian. Don't suffer as an evil doer, or you reveal you are not a Christian. Don't suffer as a busybody, but no sin into other people's matters, a busy body in other men's matters, that means you are not a Christian. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. We're talking about the normal Christian life. And those are the three places, passages in the New Testament where that word Christian appears. And you cannot understand the Christian without those passages. You cannot understand the Christian life without those passages. You cannot understand the depths and the height of the normal Christian life without those passages. The Christian. The Christian life, the normal Christian life, the divine approval of the normal Christian life. From those passages, we're going to look at three things. Number one, the perpetual reflection of a steadfast Christian life. The perpetual reflection. You're like a mirror, and the light is on. And you as a mirror, you are reflecting the rays of the light. You are reflecting the object before the mirror. And that you will see very clearly. 
if the mirror is not properly made or done the reflection what comes out is distorted but if the mirror is plain and clear and clean the reflection will be the object before that mirror christ is the one that has saved us and the christian is to reflect the life of christ if he's a true christian a normal christian a christian approved of god from heaven the perpetual reflection of a steadfast christian life point number two the painful regrets of a sinful carnal life the painful regrets of a sinful carnal life the preachers who beget spiritual children that cannot walk they cannot see they cannot hear they cannot develop normally those leaders begetting such children and they are virtually useless for anything they'll be having pain in their hearts and if you look at your own spiritual children carnal sinful blind to the truth deaf unteachable they cannot walk in the right way and you labor and labor there's regret because such a life is the opposite of the normal christian life makes you sorrowful the painful regrets of a sinful carnal life point number three the prayerful renewal of a selfless consecrated life you're a christian you're a believer you are reflecting christ in your home you're reflecting christ in your place of work you're reflecting christ everywhere and every time you hear the word of god you're so grateful you are part of this number and you pray you're not running away from prayer and you are not uh, afraid of praying you pray to renew the selflessness and the consecration of the true christian life point number three the prayer for re a renewal of a selfless consecrated life we're coming back to point number one can you tell me your number one there You are going to say it aloud. God bless you. The perpetual reflection of a steadfast Christian life. Reflection of Christ's life. We're coming back to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I read from verse 25. And verse 26, then departed Barnabas to Sartasus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians by outsiders. The disciples were called Christians by those who observed their lives. The disciples were called Christians from their way of life. They were called Christians first in Antioch. That means they were reflecting the life of Christ. It's like you see somebody from Nigeria. He talks Nigerian language. He dresses like he is somebody from Nigeria. He eats Nigerian food. Although he's far away from Nigeria, but everything you see, the characteristics, this one looks like somebody that was that has come from Nigeria. Nigeria, Nigerian. You see somebody who is reflecting Christ 
in his behavior, in his attitude, and in his interaction, in his work ethics in the place of work, in his devotion, in the assembly of the people of God. You say, this one has been with Christ, Christian. The disciples, the followers of Christ, were called Christians first in Antioch. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. He's a Christian. And you can see, he's totally identified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He says, I don't do whatever Christ will not do. He lives on the inside of me. When communication together, every time he instructs me what I should say, how I should stand, what I should do, and I reflect him because he lives on the inside of me. And then he says, the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God. I don't live by unbelief. I don't live by the prevailing standards or principles of the people of the world. It says, because they loved me and gave themselves for me. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, I read from verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Everyone that comes to Christ, the sin that God has laid down, like predestination, it's not the predestination of anybody to be saved or not to be saved, that's not it. But anyone that gives his life to Christ, the Lord has predetermined that that person will be conformed to the image of Christ. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That means then as we come to Christ, and as we abide in Christ, we are conformed unto Christ. And we are reflecting, reflecting the life of Christ. The perpetual reflection, perpetual reflection. Anytime you stand before the mirror, perpetually, as it did yesterday, that mirror will do today. And reflect the object in front of that mirror. You may not see that mirror for one year. You may not get to that mirror for one year. And then you come back to that mirror. That mirror as it did one year ago will still reflect the object that is standing before that mirror. Nothing changes if the mirror is not broken. If the mirror is not made dirty or distorted. Perpetual. The perpetual reflection of a steadfast Christian life. The normal Christian life reflects the life of Christ. What does that mean? How is Christ? And what do we reflect of Christ? Well, there are two sides to Christ. One, there are divine attributes, incommunicable. That's one you cannot reflect. Is God is equal with the Father, and so you cannot reflect that and say, I'm reflecting Christ, I am equal to God Almighty, the Creator. No, you cannot. Is the judge of the whole earth that's a divine attribute, is the creator and is the upholder of everything in the universe that's a divine attribute. That one you cannot reflect that. But he also has another side, the side, the human side, Son of God, Son of Man. Is God very God and is man, man indeed. And he lived as a man, he was hungry as a man, not as God. 
he was thirsty as a man, not as God. He walked on the water as God, not man. He raised the dead Lazarus as God, not man. Have you noticed how he raised the dead? Lazarus, come forth. You said Peter and the others raised the dead. Very different. And yes, Jesus makes you whole. You still have to refer back to Jesus because you cannot copy, you cannot reflect the divine attributes of Christ. But now, as man, he lives in our midst here. Look at what you are reflecting. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For such an high priest became us, he's talking about Christ, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Here in verse 26, you can see what we're to reflect. Christ is holy, we're to reflect that holiness. Christ is harmless. Were to reflect that harmlessness. Christ is undefiled. Were to reflect that character of being undefiled. Christ is separate from sinners. Were to reflect that. Look at this. Made higher than the heavens. We cannot reflect that. That one is divine. Higher than the heavens. Higher than the angels higher than all creation that all cannot reflect and so we reflect his life of holiness romans chapter 11 i read from verse 16 romans chapter 11 we're reading from verse 16 what you reflect in your life before the lord will approve of you as a christian are you living the normal Christian life. Romans chapter 11, we read from verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the first fruit referring to Christ, the Lamb is also holy. The people that come to join themselves unto Christ. And then if the root be holy, that's Christ, so the branches are also holy so are the branches so number one you reflect his holiness number two harmlessness because he's holy and he's harmless look at philippians chapter 2 verse 15 philippians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 15 that he may be blameless and harmless are you a christian you pose no threat to anyone you're harmless you cannot harm a baby a baby christian you cannot harm an aged man an aged christian you cannot harm the women the christian women you cannot harm a christian man you cannot even harm your neighbors because you reflect Christ in your character, in your lifestyle, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Remember Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, holy harmless undefiled undefiled that's what you reflect you go to your office whatever is happening there you remain undefiled in your community your village you remain undefiled you're working in a particular profession and the people in that profession they are known nationally that they are normally defiled people. They defile themselves and they take that as the badge of their profession. 
and you happen to be in that profession, that's okay, but you remain undefiled. You don't take the badge of defilement that those people are having. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of God. That's what you are reflecting. He is undefiled and you are undef also undefiled. Look at verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And then you remember what we read there in Hebrews chapter 7. Separate from sinners. Separate from sinners. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. Your extended family may be, may be into occultism. And the Lord is saying, are you now a Christian? Are you not born again? And you have to reflect Christ, come out from among them and be separate. You might be in a class of students. And those, uh, the other students, when the examination is coming, uh, they're looking for the exam paper. And they are paying large amount of money they are contributing although you are in that same class and you are looking forward to taking that same exam you are not part of them wherefore come out from among them and be separate it may be that you are getting married or maybe you are organizing arranging marriage for your child for your son or for your daughter and the way the people of the world do their marriage on that wedding day in the, you know, in the ceremony after the marriage, uh, they are going to have the worldly band and the worldly music. And they are going to do quite a lot of worldly things. But now you are a Christian. And it says, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You are reflecting Christ, you are separate from sinners. Christ is loving. We're coming to John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, I read from verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover. When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, and having loved his own, and having loved his son, and having loved the son, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Christ at love for his own disciples. And even though he might be going through real, serious, heavy, terrible time, he was, he was going to face betrayal and persecution. And he prayed and said, Father, if this cup cannot pass over me, thy will be done. It was something terrible and something horrible. He was going to face, he was going to drink the cup of the judgment of God over all the sinners in the world and yet in that situation he loved his own and he loved them unto the end some people if they have a little challenge in their family a little challenge for their children a little challenge with a few members of the church it affects their mood it affects their outlook it affects their love. It affects their commitment. They cannot love at such a time where to reflect the love of Christ. Whatever is happening, already the Lord has shown us. He said, 
in the world you have persecution, tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And if there's persecution in your family because you're a Christian, persecution in your place of work because you're a Christian, that shouldn't affect what you reflect. We reflect his love. Look at that same chapter and look at verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. You remember that Jesus Christ was sinless? Look at it. First John chapter 3. Without sin. The Lord Jesus Christ lived a holy life. A righteous life that's what you have to reflect he was without sin first John chapter 3 I read from verse 4 whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law for sin is a transgression of the law and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins listen to this and in him is no sin and in him in Christ is no sin then look at what follows whosoever abideth in him sinneth not you, that's what you reflect is without sin they abused him he'll not abuse back they insulted him he'll not insult them back they cheated him, he'll not cheat back. They were angry at him because he healed on the Sabbath day. He will not judge them back and say, let the fire fall on you. As Christ is, we reflect the life of Christ. Look at verse 8. He that committed sin is not reflecting Christ. Is reflecting the devil is of the devil for the devil seen it from the beginning for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil whosoever is born of God does not commit sin he does not play the game of sinning he does not gamble his eternal life by sinning. He does not forget himself. He's a mirror to reflect Christ. He's a Christian. And he should perpetually and constantly and completely every time reflect Christ. That's the normal Christian life. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Verse 9. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Christ resisted temptation. You know the story. A real Christian reflecting and reflecting Christ will resist temptation. Christ is just. A real person reflecting Christ will be just. There will be no injustice in his life. Christ is true and truthful. A real Christian, a normal Christian reflecting Christ, will be true and truthful every time. Christ was guileless, without guile. And a real Christian will be like that, without guile. In First Peter, chapter 2 verse 22 first peter chapter 2 verse 22 who did no sin neither was god found in his mouth that's christ look at the christian chapter 3 verse 10 in chapter 3 verse 10 for he that will love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his leaves 
that they speak no girl. They speak no girl. There are people that have forgotten that to reflect Christ. You cannot trust what they say. And they justify their deception, their girl, by saying, I didn't mean to do evil, but I wanted to just make him be patient with me. So I have to give him the answer I gave him. I know it's not correct. I know it's a lie. I know it's deception. I know that's guile. But I just mean to protect myself or to protect brother so-and-so or to protect sister so-and-so. Well, you're not reflecting Christ then. If you're living the normal Christian life, your life does not reflect guile. That guile you don't find in Christ. Christ was self-denying. You were self-denying. He was good. You reflect his goodness. He was faithful. You remain faithful. He was humble, lowly, and meek. Humble, lowly, and meek. And if you're reflecting Christ, you'll not reflect pride. That one is not in Christ. That's coming from the devil. The normal Christian life is a humble life. It's a whole, it's a lowly life. It's a meek life. Matthew chapter 11. I read from verse 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. That's Christ, that's what you will reflect. We'll come to point number two the painful regrets of a sinful, carnal life. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I read from verse 27. In Acts chapter 26 verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Think about it. Almost, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Have you ever thought about that word almost? Almost persuaded, that means still unconverted. Almost believing, that means unbelieving. Almost just, that means unjust. Almost righteous, I want to be there. Almost there, but we are not there. Almost righteous, that means you are righteous. Almost clean, look at that cloth. Almost clean. Look at that plate, almost clean. Look at that life, almost clean. That means you're unclean. Almost truthful. Almost truthful. I said this, that was true. I said that, that was true. But I needed to add something. And that thing I added, I was almost truthful. But you are untruthful. Almost godly, that means you are ungodly. Almost pleasant, you know, people would have lived with me. My wife would have been happy with me all the time. My husband would have been happy with me all the time. Our children would have lived happily and cheerfully at home all the time. But you know what? I'm still working on it. I'm almost pleasant. That means you're unpleasant. If you are not really pleasant, 
totally pleasant, you are only almost pleasant, you are unpleasant, almost faithful, almost faithful, but it's something that when I see money, nothing, you know, gets me. Almost faithful, but when I see women, nothing turns my head. Almost faithful. But when I see a good, a good job that days must not go, that scene gets the better part of me. Almost faithful, that means you're unfaithful. Almost profitable. Here you are, you're doing this and doing that. And then in your sober moment, you think of yourself, really? Really? I want to be profitable? And if I do this and go a little bit further, I'll be profitable. But I'm not there yet. Almost profitable, unprofitable. Almost stable, almost stable. You know, we've been sailing along, and I'm carrying this uh, glass or cup. And as long as there's no wind, as long as there's nothing rocking the boat, I am stable, and what I hold does not pour away. But now, there's a little bit of jolting, and wind is blowing, and some things are happening, and then you become unstable. Almost stable. That means you're unstable. Almost fruitful means you're unfruitful. Let's come back to what Agrippa said in verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It wasn't there. But look at verse 32. After they told Paul to go aside, Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Among themselves, they discussed, and they said in the latter part of verse 31, this man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Really, if we were to be Christian, transparent, truthful, just, righteous, we leave this man alone. It's not done anything worthy of death or worthy of stripes, but it's almost a Christian, almost persuaded. And those who are almost, they do not do things right. A simple kind of life will not measure up to the normal Christian life approach of God. What do we see in their lives? Number one, they are carnal in nature. Romans, carnal in nature. Because they are almost, they are not fully Christians. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. We need a change of nature, a change of heart, a change in our, in our disposition. In verse 8, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, carnal in nature. Two, there are corruption within, and that corruption within spills out. Corruption within and without. Second Peter chapter 2 second peter chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 12 in second peter chapter 2 verse 12 here is what it says but these 
as natural brute beasts. That's the natural nature, untouched, unconverted, uncleansed, not transformed, made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they understand not. And they, sh and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Corruption. Look at verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. We need cleansing. The nature of man is corrupt. And whatever we read and ever we speak, if we don't go to Calvary, if we don't go to Christ, if there is no cleansing, if there is no conversion, if there is no transformation, if the experience of being turned around inwardly and outwardly has not taken place, what, what will happen is there will be servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought to bondage in bondage verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world a carnal life sinful life has the pollutions of the world still but it says after they have escaped that pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if they are again entang entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So a canal, the canal in nature, they are corrupt within and without, they are cruel in character. The cruel in character. They smile when they make others suffer. And they are glad to see others suffer. They take the light in putting oppression, affliction, pressure on other people. They are cruel and they don't think anything about it. In Proverbs chapter 27 I read from verse 3 Proverbs 27 verse 3 His tone is heavy and the sand weighty but a fool's wrath heavier than them both wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous but who is able to stand before envy. And you find people who are nominal churchgoers, nominal Christians, they can ill-treat their wives until the wife is frustrated and packs out. And you see uh, wives too who are cruel and they can handle the husband and he'll say I know how to handle you although I'm a woman I will handle you and this house that you built you yourself you'll pack out and leave me in this house cruel they go to church they read the Bible but their nature has not been changed there are children who are cruel to their parents. Their parents are now old and aged. And those parents cannot take care of themselves. The parents may be their sick. The parents have become invalids. And this uh, young man, young woman, the parents trained him or trained her. And all the money he is getting now is because of the training of the parents that the parents gave him but now he looks at the father he does not even take care of the father he sees that the father needs care medical care he rather spend his money on useless things cruel 
and they go to church. I don't want to say they come here to our church, but maybe they do. They come to our church, but they don't understand how to take care of their aged parents. Cruelty in character is not of God. That's not reflecting Christ. That's a sinful, carnal life. Other people are conflict activators. Conflict activators. There's something we refer to as conflict resolution. Those are the people that are peacemakers. Conflict resolution. Those are the people that see conflict somewhere and they want to bring peace there. But other people are conflict activators. They activate conflict where there is peace and joy, unity, harmony. They don't like that. And they'll trouble the waters there and they will activate conflict. They are carnal, they are not of God. In Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 14. Forwardness is in his heart. He devises mischief continually, and he sows discord. Sows discord. Therefore, shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift, a running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. Look at this. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. Conflict, activation among brethren. Other people have covetousness. And the covetousness has not been cleansed up. They are carnal. They are sinful. They are not reflecting Christ. The covetousness distorts and destroys their mirror. In Ezekiel chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 33. Reading from verse 30. Also thou son of man. The children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. They speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee. As the people cometh, and deceit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. At the time to pray, so that the work can sink in, and the word can soak in, and the word can change their lives, and the word can probe the very deep thoughts of their hearts. At such a time, they run away. They've heard the word. And the word they hear does not make any change in them. Because they were not preaching or prayed through. For with their mouths, they show much love. But their heart goes after their covetousness the one that cannot reflect Christ whose life is not the normal Christian life is carnal in nature 
corrupt within and without, cruel in character, conflict in activation, activating conflict, covetous in the heart, compromising with the world, compromising with the world. They are mixed so much of the world, they don't know how to be different from the world. In First John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. First John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. They are of the world, you can tell. They understand the proverbs of the world, the practices of the world, and they align their lives with the expectations of the world. And when they speak, they don't want the world to know that they are different. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now those who are carnal, they have contention for recognition. Contention for recognition. They have found that in the world, if you want recognition, you must stir something up disturb everybody you must be notorious for evil and there are people that associate with christ associate with the christian body and they are contentious for recognition all they do is to disturb things to distract and to disorganize and to bring trouble and uh, if you talk, that's exactly what they were waiting for. They are contentious so that you, they will force you to recognize them. We're told in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, I read from verse 8. Romans chapter 2, verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Whatever recognition they have here in the world, and whatever praise of like-minded people, those who are like them, who like contention, whatever praise they have in the world, when we go to the other side, there will be indignation and wrath and judgment. Contention is not of Christ. Contention is not of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, always fighting, always looking for a fight, always disorganizing and disrupting, always causing discord, always knocking heads together. You're living, you're working with a family. And you see that, you know what I say, that this man loves the woman, the woman loves the man, and you don't like that. So you'll be talking to the wife about the husband. You'll be talking to the husband about the wife you're looking for contention among them. Parents and children, those, those children are obedient and they're submissive and they're respectful. And you've been watching that. And hey, you are talking to the children, bring washing the children. How is it? You know, you're listening to this old man of the old school. Or don't you think you're going to school? You're modern. And you want to bring contention between the parents and the children. 
because not of God, Christ could not, have, could not have directed you to do that. Those are people that name the name of Christ, but they are carnal, they are sinful. And it says in verse 16, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. That tells us then it's not enough to be almost a Christian, carnal, corrupt, cruel, conflict generating, covetous, compromising, contentious. I pray God will help every one of us to reflect Christ perfectly in Jesus' name. You'll say a bigger amen than that. Point number three now, the prayerful renewal of a selfless, consecrated life. Prayerful renewal of a selfless, consecrated life. Renewed. The Lord will renew every one of us. Renew our hearts. Renew our character. Renew our Christian experiences as when you first came to know Christ. That your life is renewed. And people can tell that somebody going there that reflects the normal Christian life. In Psalm 51, Psalm 51, I read from verse 10. Psalm 51 verse 10, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We deal for renewal. As we look at our lives, as we interact together, and it looks like some people they are exalting their privilege in the house of God above their pursuit of heaven. We need to turn things around. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, if he's exalted to a high position in the church, and he loses his own soul? We need renewal. Renew a right spirit within me. We're looking at Psalm 103, verse 5. Psalm 103, verse 5. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that the youth is renewed like the eagles. The youth, youthful joy, happiness, excitement as we're serving God. Not that we're dragging our feet or we're pushing everybody in front of us down. I was showing tiredness and weariness, and I was showing the old nature. He renews our youth like the eagles. He will renew you in Jesus' name. He will renew every one of us. So that the new life that we experienced before, the joy we experienced before, the excitement we had before, and the love for one another we had before not minding whatever is happening around us we will demonstrate that renewal in jesus name in isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 as thou not known as thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that has no might, increases strength. Even the youth shall faint on edict and be weary. And the young man shall utterly fall, but, tell me, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew 
their strength. You see, after you've been walking for some time, preaching for some time, helping believers for some time, singing for some time, leading house fellowship for some time, after you have been doing the work of God for some time, all of a sudden you become weary, you become tired. And now you are looking at, what can I do? The minimum I can do to get by. There's no joy in that service anymore. Now we have to be there. And we're looking at the time. We're looking at this. When are we finishing? When are we rounding up? This is enough. We're ready enough Bible. We're done enough prayer. You're weary. You don't have the same excitement and the same thirst for God and the same passion for souls as you used to have. That's why we need to come back to the altar and seek the face of the Lord. We need prayer. We need renewal. A prayerful renewal for a selfless, consecrated life. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Amen. They shall run. Tell me. They shall run and not be weary. You know, some people, even reading the Bible, they're weary. Having quiet time, they're weary. Singing to the Lord, congregational song. Right, let us rise up. We're singing from gospel hymns and songs. Number 22. And then we rise up. He can barely rise. And now, after the orchestra playing, let us sing this as unto the Lord. They open their mouths. They sing what you can tell. They're tired and weary. Gone are the days when you rise up and then you are singing and it's like you are the only one in the congregation. Your heart is rising up to God, singing the song of praise unto the Lord or whatever else we're doing. We're weary and He's showing what the Lord is saying. He will renew our strength, renew our attitude. You know, those days when we're having Bibles, Monday Bibles, still the same Monday, it seems the same Monday Bible study, and you'll find people on their way, they're running to the Bible study. Literally, literally, literally running. They cannot miss even the choruses. They're looking at their time, and when they get there to the Bible study, and the Bible study begins, one and a half hours, one hour 45 minutes what does it matter it's not the time it's the revelation and they're getting the word and then when it comes time to pray i'm telling you you remember the good old days they pray their hearts out good old days how is it today when you hear the word of god when you come to the bible study how do you react how do you respond he will renew our lives. That normal Christian life will come back again to every one of us in Jesus' name. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. You will not faint. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 2. In verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. You renew your mind by the cleansing of the water of the word. Read the word. Apply the word. Internalize it. Remember the good old days. 
Remember how you were when you first heard the gospel. Remember the thirst and the hunger and the enthusiasm. And get your mind renewed that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. He will renew us from today. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. If our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What does that mean? It says you are growing older, maybe even aged, but the older you grow in the physical in your body, the younger your heart, the younger your life, and the younger the enthusiasm you have from within. That's why it says, even though the outward man perish, you see, as the church is growing older, and we have older people, you must remember, the younger generation is also coming. And if we tailor the message to feed the tiredness of the aged people, the younger people will not have anything to stand by. The aged people, the saints will already know that. So don't repeat that, hurry up and finish. If we do that, the younger generation who have not heard, who have not known, they will never hear. You read too many scriptures, who already know those scriptures, just comment on them and pass on. If we do that because you are tired, older people, I'm not talking about you in particular, I'm talking about those who might be acting tired. If we're doing like that, the church will go to the level of the tired people. The church in spirituality, the church in understanding, the church in walking for God, the church in running for God, we will be at the level of the tired people. But no, we're going to be young again. Renewed again. Revitalized again. And then those who are tired, when they see our enthusiasm and excitement, they will rise up and they will have excitement spirituality in Jesus' name. Don't be tired. Let your inner man be renewed. For which cause will faint not. I will not faint. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen. We're not looking at the economy. We're not looking at the physical things. We're not looking at what is taking place in the community while we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen, the things which are not seen, tell me, are eternal. In Ephesians chapter 4, I read from verse 23. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's where it starts. In the spirit of your mind. Your inner life. Your spirit. Your soul. Within you there. The enthusiasm. The excitement. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that she put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I'll be renewed. 
I said I'll be renewed and then we'll do the work of God like we did it in the good old days. It will come back again. As we're renewed and strengthened, we should use the renewed strength to seek and to save sinners. Use the renewed strength to preach the gospel, to strengthen believers, and to teach the whole counsel of God. And you will not miss your reward. Here on earth, you will not lose your reward. And when we get up yonder, you will not lose your reward in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 12, I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, those who have lived the normal Christian life, they'll awake to everlasting life. Those who have reflected the life of Christ as they have been converted, consecrated, and yielded unto the Lord, they have reflected the Christian life. They'll wake up, they'll resurrect to everlasting life. And some, tell me, and some latter part of us too say it aloud to shame and everlasting contempt. Do you believe the Bible? I said, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe a judgment day is coming? Do you believe a day of reckoning is coming? You know, those who are carnal, corrupt, cruel, thoughtlessly cruel, covetous, compromising, conflict generating, contentious. We don't know when the trumpet will sound. Neither do we know when we're going to end here and the Lord will say, that's enough, come up higher. When you get to the other side, if these things are not taken away from your life, you wake up to shame and everlasting contempt. But a cleansing will take place. Today and right now, we have the opportunity to openly, seriously, frankly, transparently, honestly, go before the Lord and say, Lord, I've been acting tired. I've been acting weary. I've not been reflecting the life of Christ. And it appears everything is upside down in my spiritual life. Lord, I want you to help me. And while you are praying, you'll not disturb another person. While you are praying, you'll not hinder another person. That's carnality. But you are praying that the Lord will so turn your life around and a change will take place. That change renewal will take place in Jesus name and then should the trumpet sound and then should we die anytime in that stage of renewal look at verse 3 and they that the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. May that be your Lord on that final day in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and take all this to the Lord. What it means to be a Christian. What a Christian life is all about. And what the normal Christian life is all about. You don't want to be almost persuaded. You want to be wholly, completely, totally, entirely, fully persuaded and be a real Christian, Bible-believing Christian. And then for your strength, for your life to be renewed so that when that day shall come, you will not be ashamed in Jesus' name.